So welcome everybody. I'm Maureen Dunphy and it's great to be with you tonight. Uh, we're going to be doing actually um, a vision into the future because we're going to be talking about landscaping with native plants. And um, it's been a, a real, oh, I would say a passion of mine for quite a while. And, um, you know, anyway, we'll, we'll go on. Uh, let me see. I'm going to just, okay. So I'm, you know, basically, I just wanted to talk about our experience with gardens. And, and a lot of the times um, we go to arboretums, we go to nurseries, we go to shows, uh, we go to things like Sonnenberg Gardens here in Canadagua. And they're very formal and they're very gorgeous and it might be peaceful. Um, but there, there's a little bit of a, a different feel to them because they're really built around human aesthetics, you know, um, or roses or whatever you want to go see. And many of us are really into this. Um, I mean, I'm a member of the Rochester Area Iris Society. So yeah, I'm, I'm into cultivars and all this kind of thing. But that's not really super duper helpful to our natives, our beneficials, our pollinators. And even this um, group of colorful plants here, isn't that pretty? But you know, they're, we've got, what, what do we have here? Um, we've got nasturtiums, we've got nicotiana, I see petunias, maybe some zinnia marigolds, coleus, begonias, right? So even with an annual thing that looks kind of pretty, you have to ask yourself, hmm, who is this benefiting? Is it me? Is it my family, my neighbors? Um, is it benefiting wildlife? Well, probably not the way we think of it. And then of course, um, you get pretty wild with formal gardens and I don't know who is benefiting from this, but um, I, I, I don't know, I just saw this and like, what? what? And this, is very common, right? Big expanses of grassland. And yeah, you've got some trees here and it might be an arboretum where maybe they're even identified. A lot of college campuses, you know, have uh, areas like this. But really, who, who can really live here? So what we're gonna look at today is what do native plant landscaping have going for it that those other ones do not. So something like this um, looks a little messy. I, I did have a lot of criticism when I tried this when I was living, you know, in Canada, with the big city of Canada, with New York, right? And people were like, boy, you know what? This looks like a lot of weeds. Probably it was. But the big deal here is that native plants attract and sustain wildlife. And the biggest thing is that they support local ecosystems. So what are we talking about with local ecosystems? We're talking about the big picture of what was here even before we were, right? Um, think of it as indigenous landscapes. What was here, what was adapted? What was here because of the history of glaciation or whatever? That's what we're gonna be looking at today. So the thing about native plants is that Wildlife can use them for food, for shelter, places to raise young, right? And that's what it's all about. So especially if you want to invite wildlife into your surroundings, hearing those birds, looking at these pollinators, um, enjoying butterflies, and you know, just, just knowing that this, this place around you is pretty alive and not so dead. Um, that's what we're going to look at. So native plants have a really super important part in an ecosystem because they provide food. So what are the major food food groups, right? I mean, when I was growing up, what was it? Sugar, salt, meat and potatoes? I don't know, something like that. But, but food in a natural ecosystem is so different. Out nuts and seeds, leaves, berries, uh, insects and other invertebrates, and of course, nectar plants. So if you're thinking about inviting wildlife, you have to really think about what you're gonna provide, right? Like you're a restaurant, what's gonna be on your menu? That's what you want around your house or wherever you're gonna try this. If you're um, volunteering at a nature center, you could be putting one in. Um, these are the considerations that you wanna be thinking about. 
The other thing you want to think about are the shelters and places to raise young that wildlife is going to need. So again, we're talking pretty messy environments sometimes, like, like piles of shrubs. Um, I know I've been wanting to clean up and burn a lot of things like this. And then I'm like, well, maybe I don't want to get rid of all of it because they can provide places that birds can hide and you know, other, other small mammals uh, besides your beneficial insects. Um, who knows what might be harboring in there and trying to, trying to live. Um, shrubbery. And this, this one is, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember what that was. It is not honeysuckle, just to let you know. And trees, of course, you know, are very important for anything from squirrels to birds uh, for nesting. And then of course you, you have your, um, your herbaceous plants that are gonna be really, really important for larvae um, to, to be raised and as well as things that um, animals might, might chew on. But there's other benefits of, of um, using native plants. And, and these are more related to humans um, better for us because they'll have a smaller carbon footprint, for example. Um, a lot less CO2 is gonna be made because there's gonna be less mowing. And I have a few factoids here. Um, from one site, it said that mowers and weed whackers burn 800 million gallons of fuel a year. Of course, they contribute to greenhouse gases, right? That's America alone. And um, the EPA estimates that Americans spill more than 17 million gallons of fuel each year, like, you know, trying to fill the tanks, et cetera, there's, there's spills. And that pollutes the air and the groundwater. And the US Department of Energy says that turf grass is the nation's largest irrigated crop. 40 million acres, billions of gallons of gasoline annually. It makes up like 1% of US motor gasoline consumption, but that's a lot, right? Besides that, native plant landscapes store CO2, they're carbon sinks. The other thing is less noise pollution. I don't know about you guys, but like on a Saturday morning, even a Sunday morning, what do you hear in the summer? Just this like, everybody like revs up their lawnmower is like some kind of jamboree, right? So imagine like a Saturday morning and it's quiet because maybe you don't have so much lawn to mow anymore. At least that's what I'm hoping for in my house. They save water because they tend to be well adapted to the local weather patterns and climate. Um, a lot of our gardens that are really formal and the ones that you saw in the beginning of the show here, you know, they require tons of water. And uh, not to say when you start planting, you don't have to water for one or two years, that, that'll come later. Um, but in general, once they're established, they do pretty well. They control flooding. So for example, if you have nicely deep rooted uh, native perennials, um, it's gonna be awesome because it's gonna stop that flow to groundwater systems and streams like a lawn would do. And of course they use a lot less chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides because they're going to invite beneficials, right? The other thing too is that they're well adapted to the soil conditions. So they don't need as much nitrogen or phosphate or potassium and they reduce maintenance. And I'm gonna like put quotes around here because yeah, you gotta maintain them while they're growing like the, when they're babies, um, cause they are gonna need water the first couple of years. So think about beneficials. I wanna just focus on this for a little bit because beneficials are, are things that we don't always think about. Now as master naturalists, I think I'm preaching to the choir, right? But they are, they're so cool and the interactions that go on are so amazing. And so I just like listed a few here that you may have had in your garden experience with. Um, but in my life, I, I'm just beginning to appreciate these guys, you know, especially the parasitoids like technic flies and ichneumon wasps. And that was really because of my little voyage here into mitigating the gypsy moths we had last year. And I think they're going to be bad again this year, but enough said about that. Um, we, have, we have a lot of these guys that aren't going to be here if we don't provide habitat for them. 
So they, they will be important for us. So let's get into the definitions now. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I love terminology and it could be boring for people, but I think it just like sets the stage for knowledge areas. And a native plant is sometimes misunderstood. So, so let's talk about what is a native plant. So basically it, it's a, a tree, shrub, vine, a forb. Okay, a forb is an herbaceous. Um, it could be an annual, biannual, perennial plant. Um, or a fern naturally occurring in an ecoregion um, before European colonization. So before everybody, you know, came over in boats and settled down, you know, New York, New whatever, um, these guys were already here. And the other part of that definition is that they've evolved over hundreds, thousands of years. And that's why they're so well adapted to local soil and climate conditions. Now, we've got some other things we got to talk about here. So what about exotic plants, right? Um, these are plants that are not native to the continent on which they're now found. So for example, I had this guy in my yard um, in Canandaigua, and I didn't even know what it was. So I had to ask a neighbor and they're like, oh yeah, that was planted ba -da -ba -da -ba, 50 years before you came. And it's called Colquitsia uh, or, not, or you know, the common name is um, beauty bush. Oh, and by the way, in this presentation, I am not gonna be using a lot of scientific names. It takes too long and we could always look that up. But these guys are from central China, no surprise. And they, again, there's history. The Audubon um, resources that I'm gonna give you later have a lot of history that you could you know, explore about you know, how they came over, why they came over. And so if you're a history buff, you'll love that. This one I have in my yard, a big, huge mature ginkgo biloba tree. And of course they're from China and, um, but depending on your sources, they'll say they're from Japan or from Korea, but originally they, you know, they were from China. Now, translocated plants is another term. Now, it's a plant that it's not native to the portion of the continent where it's now found. So, for example, these guys are in North America, right? They're not China or European, but they've been moved. So, for example, California poppies found in New England or rhododendrons in the Finger Lakes area, right? So, so these are things that really they weren't here hundreds of thousands of years ago, but they were moved around as people moved around and wanted to plant them um, for whatever reasons. Then we have naturalized plants. And this is a very interesting definition because it could be exotic or translocated, but it reproduces successfully without human help. So for example, daffodils, they, they'll take over, you know, in fact, I've planted them down near the stream where I'm going to show you as a case study today um, because I just want to get the delight of, of seeing them. Norway spruce, I got a lot of that on the property that were planted by people and um, you know they've popped up here and there uh, without much help because of, of their seeding. All right, what about these guys? Opportunistic native plants. Ha, huh. now they're not, you know, these guys are not um, invasives, but they do act like it. So they take advantage, they're natives, but they take advantage of disturbances to the soil and existing vegetation. Um, they spread out, they outcompete. They're really good at taking over when people mess things up or when a storm system messes things up or when there's a really big change in the environment. So for example, I have lots of this stuff on the property and lots of this blackberry and also um, wild raspberry. And we have our favorites, the invasives. Whoop. Now, invasives have quite the conversation. I don't know if you guys have been aware of it, but there are like these, like, you know, groups on, online, you know, about why they're okay, why they're not, and how we really need to rethink invasives because of climate change. We're not going to go here. That's another presentation. And hopefully one of you might be interested in doing it because that would be fantastic. But invasive plants, they're non-native. They are naturalized because they're able to reproduce very well. They grow quickly. They spread to the point of disrupting communities. They, I don't know. I think of them as kind of like bullies, but I don't know, they're here to stay. 
but in, if you want naturalized landscapes, you're gonna have to do something about these because you gotta give the natives a little bit of a chance. So here we have Japanese barberry. We have a lot of that at Cumming Nature Center and I'm always you know, helping the kids you know, dig them out. And this one is Tartarian honeysuckle, a lot of Asiatic honeysuckles. And um, I'm just beginning to learn the difference between them. I, at, the, at this point, I, I've been calling everything Tartarian and that's not right. That's not a master gardener way. Anyway, this I just learned about because I was, I was um, online and I wanted to talk with someone actually from Long Island who is a grower. And she was talking about, about straight plants versus cultivars. So I was like, huh, I hadn't heard that term. Cultivars, yes, but straight plants, not a surprise. It's one that's grown from a seed, the original seed stock. So you, for example, you have the genus and the species, the epithet. So Acer rubrum, red oak. A cultivar is a plant bred for characteristics that a person wants or the breeder wants. Um, so here, it's gonna look a little different. You'll have the genus, you'll have the species or the epithet, and then you're gonna have the breeder's choice of name. So for example, Acer rubrum, Frank's red. And this is a cultivar of red oak and you might find it at a garden center. And typically cultivars are grown um, for very good reasons. They, um, they could be grown for these types of reasons. Disease resistance, right? Uh, powdery mildew, Dutch elm disease, blights, rust, leaf spots, you name it. Um, there are you know, plant pathologists and horticulturalists busy in the lab um, you know, selectively breeding these things into plant stocks and then being able to sell them so that we could have them in our yards and not have the maintenance needed to prevent these diseases. Some of them are drought resistant. Some of them have earlier or later bloom times, right, to extend a season or to, I don't know, invite a season in. And then, of course, there's the human aesthetics, like, wow, I'd love a plant that doesn't have chlorophyll. Doesn't that sound great? I don't know, doesn't sound great to me. But variations in bloom, leaf color, striations, um, variegations, you know, all that. Um, I remember at Rutgers, I, I, I was not a horticulture student, I was an environmental science student, but I got a work study gig in the greenhouses and I worked for a, a plant geneticist. And we developed those petunias that are super ruffly, they look like roses almost. Right, um, so that's an example. So you have really fancy, um, or you have those uh, roses that you can grow anywhere and nothing happens to them. Um, I forgot the name of them. Some of you, I'm sure, have them in your yards. But that's the idea behind it, human aesthetics. And sometimes they just want changes for the heck of it because they can. Like I had a professor who wanted to grow a, a, a pumpkin that looked like a squash, or was it a squash that looked like a pumpkin? I don't know, but I was like, Dr. Schifferis, what's the, we have pumpkins, we have squash. Anyway, the cons here, let's talk about the cons. It, the thing about these um, cultivars, and I think that, I'm gonna have to show, really move this aside a little bit, is that I, I went on the American Society for Horticultural Science and I found an article that really looked at this, this, this um, whole idea here. And, and a big deal is that insect herbivores, they don't recognize the plant as a potential host anymore. So even though at one point that plant might've been useful to that particular insect, the insect has not co-evolved with it anymore. All right, selective breeding is like manic evolution. The other thing is that insects can be repelled and this is all because of genetic tweaks, right? selective mutations. Um, they can be re repelled by an increase in distasteful feeding deterrence caused not by, not by in purpose, but because you change one mutation and it may have other, other things going for that gene, right? Change in color, shape, or phenology of a flower can reduce the amount of pollen or even the nectar available. That's a big deal. And then of course you've got double or sterile flowers and you don't get pollen or nectar. So I don't know, pros and cons, you gotta live with it. Now, 
What is the best advice? I would say for wildlife benefit, lean towards the straight plants. But I think we need to weigh the ecosystem services of each type, right? Um, oh, I have a typo there, my bad. Plant disease resistant cultivars in plant problem areas, right? So you could pop them in and, and they could do their work um, to, to mitigate some of those issues like powdery mildew, for example, or distribute them among native, native plants. So it depends on what you wanna do, but I, I see no, pro, no reason why you can't um, blend them together if you need to. Now here's the case study I'm gonna talk about today and it's all about me, all right? Because I have a pro new property. Uh, three years ago, Tom and I bought a three acre uh, place here in Honey Eye Falls. It does have Creekside um, on the property and uh, I'm gonna just like kind of walk you through my thinking about what I wanna do with this property. Um, number one is getting to know your bioregion. Now, I don't know about you, but I love biogeography. It is so fascinating to learn the history of your ecosystem. So you can go online and this is this map here is from Bailey's Ecosystem Provisions map. And um, I guess if I let, you know, hit that, it would come up because this, there it is. And I am right in here. I am like South of Lake Ontario and Monroe County, but I'm at the very tip. I mean, I walk a couple of feet and I'm in a different county. And it, it tends to be number 222, Eastern Broadleaf Forest. Now, the thing is, I'm a half hour away from Coming Nature Center, which is moving into another province, you know, and that's because of elevation. That's the way it goes. Um, so what else can happen here? You can... Yeah, you can also go on this uh, site, pollinator.org, and you can find your ecosystem just by putting in your zip code, and bam, you get an you get a re, um, a response. And again, my result was Eastern Broadleaf Forest, Continental Province. So same thing, which felt pretty good because now I, I get two inputs, right? And I kind of knew what it, what it was going to be. That was no such big surprise. So what they did though, is they told me about the native vegetation that was here before this house was built, before they clear cut it, before it was farmland, before, 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 right? And typically what was here were, was a big deciduous forest, yellow bird, sugar maple, American beech, a little bit of white pine and eastern hemlock. So those were indicative of this particular bioregion. But my house is a little bit on the Northern part of the province. So here we've got a little bit more oak hickory, and then we also have stands of maple beech and basswood. All right. So again, depending on where you are, um, things might shift a little bit. So it also, you know, things around here too, especially down near the creek, moist upland forests of the Finger Lakes region. So I've got sugar maple, basswood, and white ash. I do have some surviving white ash. Um, you know, and I'm I'm really really thinking about treating those uh, young trees um, with you know with with treatment to make sure that they don't uh, succumb from the emerald ash borer. Um, it would be really cool to get these ashes grown again. I don't know how much luck I'll have I'm working with IPM people at CCE, um, but I do have wetter sites too. And sure enough, I have American elm, I have some tulip tree, and I have some sweet gum. Remember sweet gum, everybody? You used to throw them at your brothers and sisters. They were a lot of fun. Itchy balls, we called them. Okay, so uh, here we go. And oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you. So those other resources can tell you more about your hardiness zone. You know, the zone, I, I'm, in, I'm in zone um, 6A, I think. I look on. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm in, I'm actually in 6A, bordering on 5B. Um, average precipitation, average annual temperature, glaciated history, and soil type, right? So in this, in the northern part of this province, uh, yeah, we do have glaciation um, here. Lots of moraines, esters, um, kind of cool. And then it tells you about your soil type. So mine is aphisol. No surprise because the pH I've been testing is, is pretty high. So it also tells you about your understory trees and shrubs that you should find here before people came, as well as herbaceous plants. 
All right, so what should you do after that historical part of it, if you even wanna do that? Um, totally up to you. But you should map out your existing site. Old fashioned graph paper, you know that rolly thing, if you have a lot of land to work with, or even a tape measure, if it's gonna be a smaller native plant uh, garden. Um, of course, there's computer software to do that too. I, I like the old fashioned stuff, it's kind of fun. So you identify what you have already. You, know, you put in your trees, large shrubs. And uh, in terms of what I want to do, I'm focusing on um, the wooded creekside area and an adjacent hill. I also, though, have moist uh, meadow. Um, I have huge expanse of lawn, which is not going to be around for like a long time. And I also have dry meadow. Uh, so lots of areas to look at, but I really have to focus one thing at a time. All right, so all right, how I, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna read this uh, thing, but I did want to point out that what I do have a lot of, besides these other beauties, is Norway maple saplings. Now, where on earth could they have come from? Huh. You see this guy here, that handsome dude, that's my husband. And this is a huge Norway maple right smack in the middle of the front property that was, of course, planted by the people. Um, this house was built in 1951. So do the math. That's how old that tree is. And it is huge. And I would feel really bad about cutting it down just because it's Norway maple, because it's just, I don't know, it's just it's there. So I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. How many people would you cut it down? These guys I am cutting down. You know what these are back here? They are that um, Norway maples that are, you know, they're really dark crimson color. I forgot the cult of our name, but the gypsy moths have, you know, just savaged them. They, they are dying. So um, this third year into it, and I've decided to uh, get rid of those and plant some natives. All right, so going on with characteristics of the site, you got to think about these things. Is it wet? Is it dry? What is that? And then we're talking about the soil, right? Um, and that's natural. Like, so, so you don't want to just check that out after a rain. Like, just kind of check it out over a period of, of weeks in, in the spring, um, you know, and see what's going on on the property. Check out what kind of sun you have. Um, do you have lots of sun, six to eight hours? Do you have part shade? three to six hours, or do you have real shade, less than three hours of sunlight? You look at the topography. Is it hilly? Does it have poor drainage? Is it near a pond or stream? Um, again, I mentioned soil pH. And the reason why is that if you did want to plant something that wasn't native, like you really, really wanted it, you should make sure that the soil is going to support it. So for example, I really wanted azaleas, right? But I have a high pH. So yeah, I have them. I planted them in front of the house, but I have to amend the soil all the time, you know, giving it, you know, what, what is that stuff? Um, something tone, polytone, right? But it's so artificial. I really wish I didn't plant them now, but too bad how sad. Oh yeah, yeah. And then think about black walnut allopathy. Tons of black walnuts here. It's like, what's with the black walnuts? So we did have a logger come in, um, you know, to open up some areas and also give me a chance to um, put more di biodiversity, especially down near the creek. And then you have to think about the amount of deer browse. Do you really want to put up an eight foot fence all around your house? Um, I don't. So I'm going to think about planting things that deer don't like. All right, so what is, oh, there it is. So here's the creek side, a little, little bit of it. Um, so you can see there's, and again, this was just, this picture was taken yesterday by my son. Um, and you can see what I'm working with here. So there are open spots right now uh, that you know can be planted with sun-loving um, herbaceous plants and shrubs. Here's another um, scene from it. And you can see that it is wooded. Uh, the trees are, I would say they're, they're not really super mature trees. Um, I do have some mature white pine. I have a couple of really big Norway spruces, uh, but they've been planted. But things coming in, um, 
Oh yeah, yeah. tons of basswood, uh, which is really great. Um, but the ashes are dead, which is kind of sad. And here's the hillside I'm talking about here. So these steps were part of a, a big involved um, trail, step trail that led down to a big deck near the, near the um, creek. Um, the unfortunate thing is that we found out after we bought the house and moved in that the person who built this didn't have any kind of um, uh, agreement or permission to do that. And it turns out it wasn't even on our property. The deck wasn't. So we had to take it down. So that's that was a big part of why the loggers came in to take care of some of the black walnut because they also took down the part that wasn't on our property. It was really sad. All right, the other thing you have to do, and this is number four, invasive remediation. And this is a lot of work. This is, this is like, I've been doing this for like two years now, but multi-flora rose, this honeysuckles. Um, my husband loves the Dames Rocket. He's like, it's so beautiful. What do you have, what's your problem? But the thing is, it really does. It has a, I've been reading about it and it actually changes the soil as, as does um, garlic mustard, right? Um, in a little, and I can't tell you the chemistry behind that because I haven't learned it yet. Um, but you know, mugwort, Norway maples, of course, they're going to be there because of that giant mother tree. Wild grapevines, now that's native, but they're acting very aggressively, right? So they're actually creeping along the ground as opposed, you know, and um, they have to be taken away. Box elder, like crazy. Hey, it's a native tree. It's it's. Right, it's a it's type of maple tree, ash leaf maple, but it's everywhere because it's so successful. So taking those down, so other things will get a chance to grow. And of course, raspberry, blackberry, they're all over the place. It's hard to get through things. Invasive grass. So I'm learning a lot about removal strategies from Cornell Cooperative Extension and then the Prism folks that are fabulous. Um, I can't speak highly enough of these two resources. The people are very passionate about what they do and they really want to help homeowners. All right, number five. This is the fun part, guys. This is the fun part, selecting the native plants. We're finally here. So what do you do? This one was really helpful, the Audubon Native Plant Hub. And if you clicked on that, holy cow, you get this plethora of information. And um, it's a database, you again, you can pop in your zip code and it'll whoop, tell you all the trees, understory, uh, shrubs, herbaceous plants, ferns, what have you that might work in your, um, in your eco region. The Habitat Network was another one. And I, I looked through all of these uh, with, with other, and, I, and I, I put the best of the best. Now I'm near Rochester. So Amanda's Garden in Nansville and Bacolo Nursery in Rochester, super amazing websites. Again, garden guides, uh, what to do. And I, you know, this is why I wanted the video, um, Christy, because you know, I, I thought it would be really, really fun to just like go through and you know some of these sites, but oh well, you can click on them. Oh, the, I'm a member now of the Finger Lakes Native Plant Society. I just sent my check-in last week. I am like pumped. I can't, I didn't even know it was available until I started researching for this slideshow. Cornell Cooperative Extension, of course, these folks are amazing. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they have super, super stuff. And then of course, USDA.gov, among other things. All right, so whoop, number six, you can probably really get your act together super fast by thinking about targets you want. All right, so, all right, you want this native thing, but again, it's not gonna be, I don't know, post-glaciation in a year. So you might wanna start with targets you wish to attract. And so basically you could start with host and nectar plants for insects and food sources and nesting places for the birds you want. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna get flamingos in the Finger Lakes, right? But you go on those sites and you find out what birds visit and what their you know, migration patterns are and you work from there. Again, it's all about what was there, what's natural, what might come if you provide the environment for it. All right, so I, I just did this for, for butterflies, for example. So these guys I really wanna see. 
around my house in the gardens, um, especially on that hillside, because I'm thinking, I don't really want to plant a lot of trees on that hillside because I'd like to see some of the creek, right? So I really want some herbaceous plants there. And wouldn't it be fun to just look down and see, you know, all these butterflies going around and hummingbirds and stuff. But this is what kinds of things I would need to plant. Now, again, native, 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 mm, dill, parsley, fennel, get them at Wegmans, right? But I want to see black swallow's tails. So what's what's the harm? Go ahead and plant them, put them in, whatever. Um, it's not going to hurt. But I have a lot of this stuff, so I'm really excited. Okay, now design. I I used to have a um, perennial garden design business. Um, oh, back when my second son was born, and I took a couple years off, and it was so much fun because yes, I worked with a lot of cultivars and. But this is different now because I want to work with native plants. So I have to think about the blooming times of these natives. And you know what? Go to some of those websites and design guides. They'll tell you. And there's just charts and you fill them in, you know, per month of what's blooming and what colors. And it's really, really well organized for you. Uh, then you could use that to visualize your monthly bloom phenology as well as what colors are happening when. The big deal is that you want diversity. Right now, if you're really like, you know, in terms of colors and what you see, um, you can consider palettes. So what it, you want a cool palette, blues and purples, or do you want a warm palette, you know, hot yellow, orange, reds? Do you want complementary colors that work great, like purple with yellow, blues with oranges, um, red flowers with lots of green foliage? White also looks great with green foliage, by the way. So if you're like, you know, artisty, you might want to consider some of those things. And then of course, this one's really important though, number three, consider vertical structure, right? This mimics the natural stratification of, of, of forest ecosystems or meadow ecosystems or, or whatever it is that you have that you want to mimic. Um, when you have stratification as opposed to a lawn, flat lawn, right? Rain, for example, it, it kind of goes in, in layers before it hits the soil. And so it, it can act as erosion control as well, which is really, really cool. And the last thing, waves of color is a lot better effect than, you know, polka dots everywhere. So when I'm talking about waves of color, you're planting in swaths. So at least, say, very least three plants, better five. And usually when you're doing planting, planting in multiples of odd numbers is better than even numbers. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, now sourcing your plants. Oh, please guys, you, you know this. It's illegal to harvest native plants from public lands. So I can't just go to Menden Ponds Park, which is only like 10 miles away and like, you know, secretively carry out little ferns and things I want to plant in my own yard. I can't do that. It's illegal. I mean, I guess I could do it. Who's going to, who's going to see me or report me, right? But it, it, it's, it's the thing. You, you don't want to do that because now you're disrupting another, anyway, I'm preaching to the choir here, just, you know, that. but you can find na native nurseries near you. So again, I went back to that Audubon Society site I found Amanda's greenhouse, I found Brocolo, and a couple more that I'm gonna visit this spring. Um, there's mail order, of course, but here's the deal, and I wanna tell you a story about this one. Um, a friend of mine at the Nature Center uh, told a story where <laughs> someone gave another friend some native plants right from their garden, and it was full, unfortunately, of jumping worm um, cocoons. And those jumping worms were all over her front steps. They were everywhere. And I, it was horrendous to even think about it or to imagine it. Um, but you got you to gotta watch out for that. And I didn't talk to people in the nurseries yet about that. But that's one thing I'm definitely going to be asking. And so should you. The other thing, if you have trees and shrubs coming in, check them out for Lamantria. That's um, gypsy moth, but we don't say gypsy moth anymore and spotted lanternfly egg masses. And you guys know what they look like already because that's an invasive um, presentation. Um, and that's next time. 
So I want you to wish you happy spring planting as you look forward to the fantastic job you'll do planting a native garden. Um, and I hope that next time we're here together, uh, you know, sometime in the spring, summer, maybe some of you can talk about what you're doing and why and, and share your results. I think that would be fabulous. So that's all I have for now, Christy. And uh, we can open it up for Q and A's or story time or whatever. Oh, look, we have chats. We well, do. Oh, yeah, 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 I do, I do, I will do that. I do have a resource list and I will send that out. Christy, can I send that to you then? Sure, yes, and I, I'll gladly email it to everybody who uh, who read Yeah, and Daniel Mill at pollinator.org, that's perfect, yeah, that's on my list. Crimson King, there you go, that's the one. Ann and Dave, Ann and Dave, do you like that one? The Crimson King? Can I hear, can people talk? Our, our sister, no, we're not wild about Crimson King. My sister, but... whose house was built in 1951, has a huge one. It's a yeah. 50s thing. It's a 50 yeah. sign. Yeah, it's also <laughs> eating the sidewalk and threatening the foundation. Yeah, because you know what? Those Norways, they have really shallow roots. Mm -hmm. Nothing will grow underneath them. It's like crazy. And they heave the, the sideway up, sideway up. Yeah. yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. I grew up in, um, I grew up in Bayon, New Jersey, which is right across the bay from New York. Norway maples planted everywhere. And I got to tell you something. I know why. Um, yes, they were hardy. But they provide such dense shade that you could park your you could park your car underneath them and your car gets cool. Gotcha. That's why. And yeah, you know what I'm saying. Got you there. <laughs> I hope I hope uh, anybody is anybody here from Long Island. I probably just like really. Yeah, I grew up on Long Island. I grew up on Long Island. <laughs> so where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? Go have a cup of coffee and walk the dog. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, let's see what other uh, comments. You put the links, yes, 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 yes. Knockout, thank you, thank you. I was trying to get it out of my mouth, knockout roses, and I couldn't think of it. These brain gaps are coming quicker and quicker, and I'm panicking right now, and I do think I need a, a brain transfusion. Corcus rubrum is red oak. What did I say? Did I say acer rubrum? Yes. Did I goof yes oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Oh my goodness, I made a big faux pas. Thank you, Gary. I'll fix that. And Ann and Dave too. Yep, that's what I was talking about. I was talking about red maple there. And the beneficials. Yeah, yeah. Could I, did I go back? Should I go back to that slide on beneficials? Let me sure. see if I can do that. I have to escape and go back. Let's see where those beneficials. I just, I just did a brief list of the beneficials. There's the, has that little cartoon on it. There you go. Okay, so can people see that? Right, um, it's got, you know, green lacewing, spine soldier fly, the harvest men, which are spiders actually, the praying mantis, um, beetle larvae are great, um, parasitoids. So yeah, they there's just a few of them, but, but they are, Really fabulous. Marley <laughs> Felton, yeah. Okay, so I'm making a list here. And did anybody see the word straight on the second line? It's missing the R. Straight and cultivars. Okay, I'll fix that. Anybody else catch anything? All right, super embarrassing. Okay, but anyway, folks, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. And, you know, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping so much that we can get together in the summertime um, when things get a little bit, you know, more relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, what are other people's, yeah, you know, what are other people's um, experiences with native plants so far? Maureen, there was a, there's a question that just came into the chat box. Do you have any thoughts of the cost? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, the cost of buying plugs versus potted. Yeah, I'm, the thing about the plugs, like smaller ones, um, I, I think they get root bound really quickly and you can buy them from a nursery already root bound like that. So the bigger the pot, of course, the better, but they're more expensive. 
Um, there's also there's also talk about the plastics, right? And um, you know, one nursery, one nursery, they were considering corn husk pots. Um, it was biogradable, but the, I don't see them out in the market around here at all. Everybody's doing plastics. My my basement is full of them, um, and it, it's a real huge problem. With the bare root, um, now again with bare root, you get an advantage over you know they're not in soil, so you're not you know super involving um, you know jumping worms and things like that, or not as much. Um, but like for example, the soil and conservation um, program, they send out a lot of bare root, and I've planted with them. They they don't do as well as potted plants, and. I, I think it's the stress that they're under. Um, they get dried out. They get, you know, if they're in the bags for a really, really long time, they can get bacterial diseases, um, fungi. So it's a great question, um, but you do have to weigh all that. I, for now, I'm not gonna order from soil and water conservation again with uh, bare root, um, just cause I lost so many plants last year and the year before, um, maybe just too tiny. I, and, they were out in the open. Um, they were in a big, big, huge warehouse um, walking into that. So yeah, that, that's an issue. But I, I'm really concerned too about all the plastic. So yeah, bare root is better in that respect. Did that answer the question? Oh wait, okay. We normally cut about 20 acres of meadow once a year. Quite a bit uncut. The goldenrod, milkweed, aster, wow. That's awesome. That, that really is awesome. Um, I, I would, those are all really good pollinator species and um, host plants. I know that I had my wet meadow, I have a lot of dog mane and um, that plant took me a while to identify, you know, cause I hadn't seen it before, um, but it's not invasive. Um, it did look like a milkweed though. So I was kind of like, you know, wondering what it was. Um, but just watch, watch what's growing and you can certainly put in plugs and, you know, things will reproduce. Um, in the wet meadow, what I plan on doing is mowing sections so I could take a mower, but they will be like, uh, it'll enable me to, to, you know, to walk in there and then, and then plant because it's so huge. It's like, it's like an acre just of wet meadow. So if I do it by, by sections, I'll have more, um, like with coneflower or rebecca, I'll have more of a chance to to get in there and see what's going on as opposed to walking through this, you know, knee high or thigh high, uh, you know, meadow where it, it's just so confusing. So maybe that's the way to go is to just do, do it little bit by little bit. Any suggestions for renters? Yeah, yeah. Um, that came from Camille. And, you know, Camille, I lived in Riverside, Illinois. Uh, for a while in like 1991 for a year. And then I moved back because like, it was hard. I lived in a suburb and it was all, you know, again, um, herbicided and pesticided little lawns. Um, I, I'm a runner or used to be for the foot surgery, but you know, I, I used to run, you know, and the chemical was just toxic in the air. Um, and sometimes when you, you know, you're in, um, you know, an apartment building or, you know, plant housing, you, you're really limited by what you can do because of housing associations and things like that. Um, but take it to those associations, take it to your landlord. Um, a lot of people think again, like it's gonna be like super weedy, it's not gonna look good, but I think you have to make the case for corridors, right? Every, really it's out there, we need pollinators. I mean, you know, what is it, every bite? You need pollinators. It's crazy how how much food is going to be lost if we don't have pollinators. It really is a big, huge problem. And right now, the idea, even with urban environments, is to provide corridors where you have these pollination plants or pollinator plants, pollinator friendly plants, and the pollinators can get from point A to point B to point C, even if it's not one big meadow, right? So you can do it in an urban environment. But that may be a case for, you know, making a, a, a presentation to a group of neighbors. Um, that's what I would do. I think you have to be pretty aggressive about it. And good luck. But it's possible. Oh, the other thing, Camille, you could do pollen, you know, native plants in pots. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people have basil, dill, parsley, you know, thyme, rosemary. Um, why not do natives in pots? That's another way of doing it. Even on fire escapes, I've seen that or pictures of it. Kind of fun. Uh, you could also get seeds and stratify them over the winter. Yeah, I did that with milkweed last, um, last year. Um, put them in the freezer and grew a whole boatload of them, like hundreds of them, and I donated them around. That's a really good idea. You set her up. Container gardening, yeah, great. Slowly adding beds, decreasing lawn, replacing exotics with naturals. You still plant some nectar. Oh, the butterfly bushes. Maybe evil, but the butterflies flock too long. But that's the point I was trying to make, you know, like you're 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 so much on the right track with your natives and yeah you get a butterfly bush in there um you know you get the purists and then you get people who are kind of okay you know with having a buffet instead of a formal dining room it, it's it's totally up to you uh spice bushes i touched this one too so it was amazing about oh yeah nice yeah, it is. It really, when you can see things up close and wonderful like that, it, it it's pretty amazing. Um, included portable castor wheels, raised containers. Yep, yep. Two acres, slowly converting. Wow. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I mean, when you've got kids, you want some you want some green space for them to run around and and roust about on, right? Um, beautiful. Goldenrod and nettle. Nettle, again, is a very, very good house plant. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of what it was now that, that I was looking at that it um, is attracted to. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here again tonight. So I wish you a lot of luck in your efforts. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a boatload of work though, isn't it? Um, you know, again, that and I'm not kidding about those invasives. It just who knew? <laughs> what were they thinking when they brought in multiflora rose? What were they thinking when they brought in Japanese knotweed, right? Um, things change over time. And that's where we are right now with, uh, with putting up with it. But gotta be easy on yourself too. Don't hurt yourself in this whole this gardening. All right. For sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Maureen. I have I have one question, and I think somebody brought this up in an email. Um, maybe it was Tony a while back. Um, but for um, jumping worms and eggs, like what's the protocol uh, when you receive or you purchase a, a potted plant? What's the protocol to make sure that you're not transferring your you know or planting using soil that's contaminated? Well, the problem with the um, the problem with soil that has the egg casings is that they're so minute you can't see them. So um, the only thing I was able to find on that is that it's just testing your area for jumping worms, and that is like I guess after they hatch out with the with the mustard, right? So it's a third a cup of must of dry mustard in a gallon of water. You pour it on certain places and they just completely bubble up and squirm and hop all over the place. They tend to have a like a sidewinder movement mm -hmm. as they move. And then you pick them up, you put them in a black bag and you put them in the sun to roast or throw them in the garbage. Um, but you can't let them back out because you know then you'll have jumping worms. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course report it, like go on IMAP invasives or call CCE or whatever and, and report where that location is. Um, I'm going to be super careful about, you know, where I'm getting my, my stuff from. I'm asking, I'm going to ask questions at every nursery, what they're doing about it. Um, and I, but I, I really, if anybody has an idea about that, yeah, get on that chat because I would like to know as well. Um, because my only idea here is, you know, to keep checking your property of where you planted these things and see if if they, you know, if they come to the surface with the uh, with the mustard. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like Tony might have left. Um, but I think, oh, Shosh said she can talk about jumping worms. Yeah, I, I think Tony said he was, um, if he got a plant, he was putting the soil in a trash bag and rinsing the roots or something and then planting the plant. Shosh, do you want to unmute if you have something to, to add? 
Yep, um, I, don't, I have a washing machine going behind me, so it might end up kind of loud, but it's more on the giving plant side. If you have jumping worms and are going to someone else's place, you want to rinse off your shoes and any gardening tools that you're going to have to make sure that there's no soil left on them. And if you're giving someone plants, the best we've come up with at Tompkins County CCE, where I'm a master gardener, is to triple rinse the roots. They, they are working on coming up with like a research-based protocol, but triple washing is the best we have. And just again, to get every bit of soil off the roots that you can find, it's harder once you're bringing it, a plant onto your own property, because if you don't have them already and say you have a well and septic, like if you if you try to rinse soil off into your sink, I can tell you it will clog up <laughs> that drain. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and that's what you need to do. So like if I give someone plants, I have to rinse them off, uh, like triple rinse them before giving to someone. And if I'm potting something up for someone, if I have a bag of soil, because I have jumping worms, uh, if I have a bag of soil on the ground, they get into that bag of soil like through the plastic and all um and so, there's currently yeah there's currently not a way to get rid of them but they're hoping they might have one at some point yeah but i i see your point because it's almost like you want to get them down to um, bare root um and then and then plant them in fresh soil yep oh wow what a what a dilemma oh. Yeah, so you know, let us know if uh, any protocols emerge. I'll I'll be uh, in touch with Monroe County CCE and see what's going on. But it sounds like Cornell is really onto that. Yeah, I went to the um, ag and or I guess agriculture and horticulture in service week a couple weeks ago and went to a session on jumping worms, and that's what they that those are the things that they were saying. The way we've been doing it at uh, Tompkins County for our plant sale is we triple wash roots uh, before potting into potting soil that has not been on the ground and we have to wash all the pots that we put things into and it's it's really hard and you don't like even if you rinse them down to bare root you know it's possible that there's still some little eggs stuck on them that you can't see yeah and those eggs survive the winter yeah. Boy, then it then it begs the question about predation, right? Like what could possibly predate, you know, against, you know, the little ones, the little worms anyway. And help. I think that's the thing they're working on now. And and the thing is, what they said is if you see them, it is worth killing them because you're, you know, you're not letting the population increase. Although like I I can't imagine how I would be able to do that on my property because I just have tons. Yeah. Oh, uh, where are you? I'm in Tompkins County. Thompson County. Like, okay. Near Ithaca. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And we have tons here, and because our county already has lots of them, when people contact us to say we have them, we're like, I am sorry that you have them now. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't we can't really record it because it's like yeah yeah they're pervasive but what we can say is if you're going to someone else's house and you don't know if they have worms wash off your gardening boots wash off all of your tools it's it's just really frustrating you know i'm glad i'm glad we brought up this conversation though because it it's hitting us right in the face and if we're prepared for it it's better than not Definitely. Yikes. It's kind of like keeping up with all the changes with COVID. It's just like one thing after another. But I mean, we're alive and knowledge is power. So let's go for it. Let's keep learning. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks and... for the feedback, everybody. Yeah, some of these some of these slides I made like, you know, really in the dead of night when I should have had a cup of coffee. So <laughs> uh, I I appreciate your uh your retrofits. You're awesome. 
Yes. Well, thanks to you. And thanks to everybody for joining. We had 33 people at one point. So oh, that's great. Um, it was wonderful to see everyone. And we, uh, this is the last one of, of uh, 2021. And we will be back in January, January 10th, Lori Dittmer is going to uh, give a presentation on bees, honeybees. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. And happy holidays to everyone. And uh, take